Hello, Portland. Hi. So, um, Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so tonight's kind of a special night for me um, because if you saw the tweet, um, I introduced Sidekick at Portland Ruby three years ago, um, almost to the day. And uh, it's grown from a, a little side project that I built in two weeks and introduced to y'all to uh, this big thing now. So, uh, but I want to reintroduce it to all the new people um, because I'm amazed over the last few years how much Portland and the Ruby community here has changed. Um, how many people here have actually used Sidekick before? So less than half of the room. That's awesome. Welcome all the, the, the new Ruby people. I'm, uh, that's why I wanted to I talked to Crispin about wanting to give this talk, is I got the sense that there's this huge influx of new people into the Ruby community. And um, so we need to reintroduce technologies at a regular rate uh, for all the new folks. So uh, my name is Mike, and I write Sidekick, which is an open source background art framework. <clears throat> and about myself, I've been programming for uh, the web for 15 plus years. For the first half, I did Java. And that was a lot of fun, as you might imagine. Um, but for the last eight years, I've been doing Ruby, and increasingly more open source, and increasingly just enjoying Ruby and Rails. And I love it, and I had no plans to stop anytime soon. The key thing that I want you all to understand, and I want you to help me with here, is I am not a beginner anymore. I am an advanced Rubyist, and therefore it's hard for me to get into the headspace of someone who's new to the community and someone who is new to this topic. So as I give this presentation, if there's something that's confusing you, if I'm leaving you behind, please raise your hand and ask questions. Stop me. I want this to be a, more of a beginner talk, and so I want everyone to be able to follow along. So don't be afraid to raise your hand and stop me. I'm also the only person on the agenda tonight, so if I run long, I don't think Kristen's really going to care. <laughs> so I will be up here as long as anyone wants to talk to me. Um, for my personal career, Rails was a nuclear bomb. Uh, it was a nuclear bomb for the entire web development community back in 2005, 2006. Um, it really changed the way web development was done. And the minute I saw it, I said, I don't want to do Java anymore. I want to do Ruby. And that's when I immediately started doing side projects, nights and weekends. Um, and I'm sure y'all are doing much the same. You're working on side projects to bring up your Ruby skills to find a job in, in, the, uh, in this arena. And, and like you, I spent a year bringing up my own skills in Ruby and Rails before I actually found a job at, at a company uh, that was willing to train me professionally as a Rubyist. So over the last, uh, what was it, seven or eight years, I've worked at uh, half a dozen different startups doing Ruby. But one thing that I've increasingly done more and more of is open source. Open source is a huge part of the Ruby community. Uh, unfortunately, as I did more and more of it, I realized that I was sinking more and more of my life into open source. Uh, and I also have a family, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't justify all the work I was doing for free as open source with leaving my family behind and leaving them to go work in a coffee shop for a few hours to support people, <clears throat> to support perfect strangers on the internet that wanted to use my projects. So I actually started my own company uh, this past year called Contributed Systems. And I'm actually selling commercial versions of my open source projects. Uh, so Sidekick Pro and Inspector Pro are actually uh, commercial products that pay for my salary, pay for my rent, and feed my family. Um, but everything I'm going to show you here tonight is Sidekick. It's open source, and it's free for everybody to use. So that's all I'll say about that. Uh, I want to tell a story now um, about e-commerce. Uh, has anyone worked at an e-commerce company before? Okay, just one or two. Um, we've all shopped at Amazon.com though. But what I want as a, as a thought exercise is for people to think about what happens when you hit the place order button. 
what are the what are the series of steps that need to occur uh, when you do that most important step in a business? Um, the place order button is the most fundamentally important event to an e-commerce business, uh, and so there's a lot going on behind the scenes to power that that action. Uh, I worked at an e-commerce company for the last ten years, and uh, the place order action was some of the most complex code we had. Uh, when I thought about it, these are the steps that I came up with that we ran uh, when you hit place order. The, the most important thing that you need to do in the first step is you, you have to validate what you got. You're, you're getting data in from the open internet, from the user's browser. You have to validate addresses, you have to validate credit card numbers. You do all this work to make sure that the order is going to be placed successfully. But the next two steps are the fundamental order transaction. We were a, a physical e-commerce company, so we're selling merchandise that's in a warehouse. You don't want to double sell that merchandise. So when you hit place order, we reserve that inventory, and then we authorize your credit card. So those two steps go hand in hand with each other. That's a transaction right there. Um, assuming that passes and everything goes well there, we then send the order receipt email to the user. We sync that order to the warehouse so that it can be shipped out. And we also sync that order to our accounting system, slash ERP system, whatever you want to call it. Only then, once all that's done, do we render the thank you page. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of steps there. And there's a lot of network round trips. Uh, we're contacting third-party servers. So there's a problem here. All that work is really slow and fragile. Who knows if that warehouse system is going to go down? Who knows if that email server is going to become unresponsive? So you really can't trust the third party services that you're working with. The fundamental question we have to ask during this, during any sort of action that we're taking on behalf of the user is, do we need to do this work right now, or can we do it later? So that turns out to be the recipe for using background jobs is do as little as possible to take action on the user's input. Everything else, spin off as a background job that you can perform later somewhere else. And so thinking about the series of steps that I plotted when we hit place order, we think about uh, the three steps where we contact a third party server it's really not critical that that happen in the millisecond that the user hits place order. If they get their email a couple minutes late, big deal. If that order goes to the warehouse system in an hour or two, the world's not going to end. Any, any sort of syncing or that email, it, it can happen asynchronously. It's, it's really not that important. <clears throat> and so those, those three items can be contained into, can be placed into a background job. And background jobs have three traits that you want to consider. Anytime you're thinking about work that you want to perform in the background, uh, a job needs to be self-contained. So you need to give the information. A uh, background job is just a set of, of arguments, essentially. So those arguments need to describe perfectly what that background job needs to do. A job needs to be retriable, also. Jobs are going to fail. They're going to they're going to throw errors occasionally, and so they're going to be retried. So you have to consider what happens if this job is, is retried. Jobs also need to, need to be parallelizable. That is, a job's not going to run just on its own. If you have hundreds of jobs executing at once, you need to think about uh, all those other jobs that are running in parallel with that other job. So. <clears throat> Those three things are, are critical for any, any sort of background job. And, and I want to remind everybody, if I'm losing anybody, please raise your hand and ask questions. Um, so that's a little bit about a background job in general. Now, what should a back, background job system provide you? I came up with four key traits that any system you use should have. The, the most fundamental is the ability to create background jobs, right? 
Uh, so you need to be able to schedule work. Um, there's there's three sort of uh, use cases that I could think of, uh, which is just execute this job right now. Uh, execute this job at some relative time in the future, a day from this point in time, or a specific instance in time at 11.43 p.m. on Sunday. When you're building an application, you'll find use cases for all three of these, these scenarios. Uh, for instance, a new user signs up on your website. You want to send them an email in three days saying, hey, thanks for coming to the website. By the way, have you checked out this new content? Easy to do uh, with that sort of uh, relative time scheduling. The second most important trait is error handling. Your jobs are going to fail. Who here has written code that has bugs in it? Yeah, exactly. What the hell? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> nice try, John. <laughs> <laughs> now we know why New Relic's code is so awesome. <laughs> it only writes it and it's bug free. Um, so we all write buggy code. We all ship stuff that has uh, things that we forgot. Maybe has typos. Uh, maybe we're not the best at writing test coverage and there's a, there's a, um, a path that was not covered. Whatever happens, uh, so your jobs are going to fail at some point. And so you need your background job system to have a catch-all that catches those errors and then retries that job at some point in the future. Now, what you don't want is a job system that will just retry that job like every 30 seconds. That's bad. Um, the best practice in the industry is what's known as exponential backoff. And so your system should retry uh, a minute from now, two minutes from now, four minutes from now, eight minutes from now, an increasing amount of time between retries. The third most important thing is your background job system is a black box. You need to have some sort of visibility into that black box. So you're going to want some sort of user interface where you can introspect various aspects of your job system. You can see what's running, you can see the errors that it's caught, what's, what's pending, uh, maybe jobs that are scheduled, all that sort of stuff. The last most important trait is performance. If you have an organization that's running a thousand jobs a day, performance probably isn't that important to you. But if your organization is growing quickly and is running 10,000 jobs a day today and may be running a million jobs tomorrow and a hundred million jobs six months from now, you're going to want a system that can keep up with that, can scale with that volume of, of work. So, uh, considering performance, uh, performance is always important to consider when considering a, a background job system. So, all this is me rambling on in theory. I hope I haven't lost too many people yet. Um, but I want to get down to the nitty gritty and, and demo some stuff. Uh, I also want to talk about Sidekick specifically. No, I'm sorry, Joe. Well, I was just going to suggest. Um, I think for people who are new, uh, they probably don't have a good handle on like why would you even want to do certain things in the background, and what would you want to do in the background versus what do you want to do in the foreground. Uh, you're right. Okay, so I didn't call out um, terribly explicitly well um, in that place order example I talked about. Remember, I showed those seven steps. Let's go back here. I showed those seven steps that we have to do. But then I called out these three as sort of optional. They don't need to be done while the user is waiting at their browser. That's eight steps, not seven. I'm sorry. This is the user. Oh. This is the machine doing these seven steps. I did. I Off by one, probably. Off by one, exactly. Everybody writes buggy slides, right? So these three steps are contacting third-party servers, they take a while to go over the network. Um, they're slow, they're fragile, because those systems may go down. What we can do, as I, I tried to explain, we can take these three steps and perform them in the background asynchronously on a different system. We don't need to do them while the user is waiting for their browser to spin and for the thank you page to load. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking as much work out of this action and putting it into the background so the user, the, the page renders as quickly as possible to the user. So the user's happy, they have a good ordering experience. 
and at the same time, the order of actions becomes more robust because these third-party systems going down won't break the page, right? When, when we run this code, we're just running this step, this step, this step, and then the render. The user doesn't care, and, and the user doesn't see these three steps, uh, or they're not performed while the user is waiting. So, uh, so we want to throw work in the background for performance, so that the page renders as quickly as possible, and for resiliency, so that if there are any errors with these three actions, we can recover gracefully. Yeah, way back, way back. Um, and also because the errors in those three actions don't necessarily affect the processing of the order. Correct. Like you just have to charge their credit card, make sure you have the warehouse, and it's like, all right, we're good enough to do this stuff later. Exactly. Yes, the, this is the fundamental transaction here. And then once this is done, we just want to render the page and say thank you. Everything else can be done later, as you said. It also is the case that these three are orthogonal to each other. It doesn't matter if this fails and this works and this fails. Like these three don't depend on each other at all. So in fact, we're going to create three different background jobs for each of these steps so that if one of these fails, it doesn't affect the other two. Everybody with me? Better? Is that yeah, yeah. Is that your explanation? Uh, I understand. I just yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done this in the last year, so I know what my mindset was a year ago. Awesome. So. Well, this is exactly what I was thinking too. Yeah. I, I I struggle to put myself in, in the head of someone who's learning this stuff. So. Uh, any other questions so far? Okay, I don't see any. So let's move on. Uh, so I wanted to talk about Sidekick. Sidekick is my project uh, that I, like I said, introduced here three years ago. Uh, the website is Sidekick.org. Uh, the most important link on the site is the link to the wiki. Sidekick has extensive documentation about every aspect and every feature that it, it provides. Uh, and it's, for, I like to think for an open source project, it's pretty, pretty darn good documentation. So if you're trying to learn about background jobs, you're trying to learn about the various features, uh, this is good stuff to, to read through, to spend maybe 30 minutes just going through the various pages. Uh, I can't not talk about the big new API for background jobs that shipped in Rails 4.2, Active Job. Um, previous to Rails 4.2, all the different background job systems all had their own native APIs that you use to create background jobs. Rescue had an API, Delayed Job had an API, Sidekick had an API uh, that was somewhat compatible with Rescue. But everybody had their own flavor. And so DHH and the Rails core team took uh, sort of the common functionality that all these systems exposed and created uh, the active job API. It's really nice and really easy to create your own background jobs in Rails now. Uh, you can even deliver emails asynchronously with just by calling deliver later. It's very simple to do. Uh, and active job supports uh, something like a dozen different job systems, including Sidekick. So let's bust out some code. I want to show you a Rails web app that I recently built. It's a very simple web app. Uh, can I get any higher resolution? Is that possible? Uh, yeah, it's up to your computer settings. Okay. So if I go to display, hold option and then click scale. Wow, that is that's uh, good. Yeah, there you go. The word. Wow, that is some What's high finish. Yeah, not too shabby. All right, uh, so am I looking at? Okay, you're looking at my. Please envision. Big it. Yes, sir. Can you make the logo bigger? No. Are <laughs> you? Anything. Let me know. Good here. So let's let's fire up. Uh, so I I built this Rails web app, which is a competitor to Discourse. Has everybody heard of Discourse? It's forum software built in Rails. 
Uh, I decided to build a, com a competitor called Discontent, which has targeted all the trolls and terrible people on there. <laughs> so if you're a troll or a terrible person, you can go to this discontent web app, and you can post to your heart's content all of the vitriolic, angry rants you want. <laughs> uh, so let me bump up this and fire up the Rails server. So here is discontent. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not the world's greatest at styling and sort of front end design, so I don't expect much. Uh, so I want to open up the post controller. We're looking at the, the index of posts here in the system. We can create a new post. There we go. Okay, so when we hit, hit create post, uh, that's going to go to this create action. It's going to create a post object from the based on the parameters, and it's going to save that to the database, and then redirect. Very vanilla Rails. I hope that most people are, are, are familiar with this, uh, this sort of code. Uh, there's a problem, though, in that uh, we're going to have a lot of terrible people posting content here. And the one thing we don't want on this site is obscenity. We want to make sure that they, they keep it clean. So we want to write, I know this may be a Sisyphusian task, um, but we want to create uh, an obscenity filter. So anytime someone posts something, uh, it cleans up the language. So what I've done is I've created an app models I've created a filter of synergy class. And this is just a simple Ruby object which takes a post ID and it cleans the title and the body of the post. So it takes bad words like poop and turns it into dookie and python into Ruby. <laughs> yeah, it's too easy, I know. Um, <laughs> so what we can do is we can go back to our create action and we can just enable this filter. So we call new on the class to create an instance, and then we just call the perform method on it with the post that we just saved. That will go through the content and update the post and save it. Then it will actually redirect to the post page. So let's create a new post. Um, so I like Python. So we'll create the post, and you can see it filtered out that obscenity. It's okay, you can apply. You can apply. <laughs> Keeping the internet clean. So, uh, so that's great. That is uh, that was easy to do. The problem, though, is that anytime we add functionality here to our controller, we're slowing down the page rendering, right? The user's waiting for that action to take place. As we saw with the place order, with those three actions, with the, the obscenity filter, do we really need to do this right now, or can we do it later? The answer is, of course, we can do it later. So what I've done is created an active job, which does the same thing. You can see here, I've got a filter of obscenity job class. And all that does is subclass active job base. Literally, this is the exact same code. The only thing we've done is subclass active job base. Aside from that, an active job is simply a Ruby object. The only contract, the only caveat, is you have to have this perform method. So we'll do the same thing here. Is we're going to use the active job API to create a background job. So we, we call filter obscenity job with this method called perform later. And this actually takes your arguments and creates a background job for those arguments that can be executed somewhere else in the background. 
So now that we've enabled that, let's create a new post. <clears throat> This site is I'm a terrible person. So, uh oh. Okay. Well, we still have poop here. The obscenity is still there. That's no good. Um, so, what's going on here? You're not well, running your background jobs. We're not running background jobs. Exactly. Sidekick, your background job runner, is a separate process from your Rails web server. So you need to start it up. I also haven't really covered how to integrate Sidekick yet. So let's go over the steps to integrate Sidekick with the application, and then we'll start it up. So in my gem file, I'm going to essentially add these two lines, gem Sidekick and then gem Sinatra, which we'll see powers the web UI that I'll show you here in a second. Uh, <clears throat> Once I've bundled, once I put that in my gem file and bundled, I then go into config application RB, and I add this line right here, line 26. Config active job queue adapter is psychic. Yes? Would this information be in the wiki? This is in the active job guide oh. in the Rails documentation. It will tell you. Uh, and yes, the Sidekick wiki also has a page on Active Job that says how to integrate it. So it's in both places. Um, but so far, we've, we've added the, the gem to the gem file. We've added this config line to our config application RB. And then the third thing we need to do is activate the web UI. And to do that, it's just these two lines. We require Sidekick Web, and then we mount the actual class at this URL. And this URL is anything you want. It can be admin sidekick or whatever. Uh, so, let's go back to our controller here. Uh, those, are the, those are the three steps. I mean, it's literally five lines of code to integrate sidekick with your Reds app. Now that we've integrated it, we actually need to start it up. And that is really simple also. Bundle exec sidekick. Now, you can see, uh, prints out a bunch of preamble. But down here, guess what? Our job just ran. So we can go back to our page, refresh, and now it says the site. Say that again? Yes, so that is a caveat to Sidekick specifically. Uh, it is multi-threaded, and when you are multi-threaded, you can't use Rails' fancy auto-loading in development to uh, reload your code every single time you refresh. So anytime you do change code, um, your workers, you do need to reload uh, Sidekick. Uh, in general, this, this isn't as much of a problem as you might think, because workers are designed to be unit tested really easily. So ideally, you have RSpec or main test uh, suite, which covers your workers and, and are exercising them. So <clears throat> let me open up my notes here to see what we want to talk about. Oh, OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is Sidekick's native API. So we've covered active job, which is simply that perform later method. Sidekick also has a native API. Because active job uh, covers all the different background systems that Ruby has, it only covers you know, a certain percentage of the functionality that Sidekick exposes. So oftentimes, if you want to get access to more some of the more esoteric parts of Sidekick, you need to use the native API directly. The native API is almost uh, identical to Active Jobs API, believe it or not. Uh, instead of jobs, you call you create workers. And so I've got a worker here called Hello Worker. And instead of subclassing Active Job as we did before, we just include the Sidekick Worker module. But you have the same contract. You have a perform method, which takes a set of arguments. And that's it. It's really as easy as that. So we can actually fire up a console 
Yes. We'll, we'll create a job right here on the list console. So you can see that what this does is it takes a string and it just interpolates the string and logs, logs that string. Now, if we go back to Psychic, you can see that our Hello Worker job just ran and printed out Hello Mike. So, working in the background. Uh, one thing I want to show here is this, this is called a JID or a job ID. This is a unique identifier for every single background job you create. Kind of like a database ID, like the ID column in Active Record. The job ID allows you to keep track of a specific job. Also notice that when Sidekick runs a job, it actually logs that JID as part of the execution. <coughs> so in production, if you're trying to debug a particular job, you just need to grep by the job ID. <clears throat> Questions so far? Okay. Yes? So uh, you have your Rails app running, and then it basically sends something to this other thing that's running, which is Sidekick. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? Great question. Um, so you have the two moving parts, right? And what, what Sidekick calls those things are the client and the server. The server is the Sidekick process that's running your actual background jobs. The client is your Rails web app. In this case, this is, your, this is the client API. What this API does is it takes those arguments to that method and pushes it to Redis. Redis is Sidekick's data store. And so Sidekick is constantly listening to Redis waiting for jobs to be pushed into, into Redis. As soon as it sees those jobs pushed onto a queue in Redis, it pops off that job and runs the associated code. And that's where you see this stuff executed. So you actually have a little snippet of information going from your Rails web app into Redis, into Sidekick. So I can actually shut down Sidekick Sorry, one second. Go over here, I can create a bunch of jobs. And nothing bad happens, nothing blows up. And that's because Redis is still up and running. The job is just hanging out in Redis. This is a good spot, I think. Sorry, did you have a question? It's fine. OK. Um, this is a good point to jump into the web UI. So Sidekick ships with a full web interface for monitoring what Sidekick is doing. Um, this is the dashboard. This actually gives you a real-time view as jobs execute. You'll see spikes appear here. And then you can also see sort of a monthly history of your jobs that you've executed, along with some operational information down here. I'm going to blow this up a little bit. There <clears throat> you can see, if you remember, I enqueued a bunch of jobs after taking down Sidekick. And you can see that they're enqueued in Redis here. This web UI is calling out to Redis to find out what information is, is sitting there. So we can see these four jobs are waiting to be executed. So we'll go back to the dashboard. We'll start up Sidekick. And we should see those four jobs execute immediately. Boom, there they go. That's how you get that resiliency. Is it doesn't matter if Sidekick is down. It doesn't matter um, as long as that client can push that job to Redis. At some point in the future, that background job will be picked up and executed. Way in the back. And so does your sort of your own instance or Sidekick have some sort of know what to look for on Redis? Just... Absolutely, yes. There is, you can fully configure the Redis that you want to talk to. You can give it sort of connection parameters. Uh, you can point it to, uh, maybe you have three or four different Redis instances based on the complexity of your, your environment. 
uh, you can point Sidekick to a particular Redis. You may have different Sidekicks pointing to different Redises for different applications. You can get as complex as you want to get. And that's all like configuration It's all in, yeah, the, you can create an initializer for your Rails app which configures Sidekick and tells it how to contact Redis. Uh, so, you can see now that um, we've, we executed those four jobs, you can see the spike that happened here. You can see that enqueued is now zero because everything's quiet. Uh, we can jump to the busy tab, and that shows the processes, the sidekick processes that we're running. And it gives you a little bit of information, tells you what queues it's actually listening on. We're only using the default queue, but you can create any number of queues for whatever purposes you want. Yes. So when you include um, Sidekick in your bundle, does it automatically start and deal with Redis um, on its own, or do you have to also manage Redis at all? Or uh, no, it does not do that for you. You still have to install Redis, and you have to uh, administer it, or more generally, uh, people who are running an EC2 or Heroku oftentimes will use a Redis service. So you pay $50 a month and you get access to a Redis somewhere out in the cloud. Okay. And is this console running off your Rails app? Yes. Okay. And so since you have the ability to have it on Redis like this, I'm imagining that you can configure a sidekick to run on just other disconnected servers that you can ping, and is that possible? And how complex would that be if so? Ask the question again. Like, do you have to have all your jobs go to your Rails server? Or like if you have maybe a super massive project and you have to be partitioning stuff out, mm -hmm. is it possible to have like sidekick on its own server just receiving jobs and then managing them? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, uh, so just as you can run your Rails web app on many different machines, and they're all talking to a master database, uh, you know, a MySQL or Postgres instance, you can have Sidekick processes running on many different machines, but they're all going to talk to the same Redis instance. Same, same general idea there. Yes? The Sidekick uh, have any implementations or flavors outside of the Rails ecosystem? Yes, there are some implementations in various other languages that try to sort of recreate the same sort of feature set. Um, Go notably has a few different worker projects which uh, encapsulate a, a small bit of the sidekick functionality. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know that Node has anything. Um, but the sidekick that you maintain uh, the Pro version of one it's, a, it's for the Rails ecosystem. Yes, absolutely. Uh, more specifically, it's for the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, it does not require Rails at all, but it does integrate tightly with Rails if it's part of your project. So you can you can queue jobs from anywhere if you need it to. You can have like a queue node service off here, let's say Twitter. And if you wanted to do something with that tweet, you could somehow get it into Sidekick and process it through inside. Right. So the, the question is um, do you need to use the Sidekick Ruby API to push jobs? The answer is absolutely not. The, the Sidekick data format in Redis is well documented, it's very stable. It, it's just a hash of data, essentially, um, that is converted into a JSON string. So if you can push JSON, to Redis, you can you can push Sidekick jobs in any language, and I have uh, I know users that are pushing Sidekick jobs in PHP, uh, in Node.js. Um, I've even heard of people in .NET C# -sharp doing it. So again, all you need to be able to do is create JSON and push to Redis. So I'm guessing you probably don't want to pass like complex Ruby objects uh, as arguments to your workers. Slow your roll, pal. <laughs> 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 so, 
stealing all my slides. I'm not going to have any slides left to talk about with all these questions. Um, but it's absolutely a good point and one that I talk about. Um, anything else so far? Okay. Uh, so we've got this cool web UI. Uh, it shows you the processes and the jobs that are currently executing. You can go in and, and introspect the jobs that are in the various queues. Uh, one thing I want to talk about are these three tabs here, retry, scheduled, and dead. Sounds very fun while I know. Um, what, I did mention that your jobs are going to fail, and you're going to have bugs in your job. So I want to show you kind of what that looks like. I'm going to create a bug here. So I've got a typo here. I'm going to reload Sidekick, because I just changed my work code, so I've got to reload it. And then I'm going to create a job. <laughs> So that's 076, it's the JID. You can see that it blew up. It tried to execute that job and it failed. Uh, you can see, where's my cursor? Right there. And so there's, there's the exact error message. It's exactly what we expect to see. If I go into the web UI, I can refresh, and there it is. Sidekick caught that job, saw that it threw an error, and has saved it for you to inspect if you'd like. You see all the data about the retry that you need to know. So you see the error message in the class, but you also see this retry count and when it's going to retry it. And you remember I mentioned that exponential back off. Sidekick will, as this number increases, Sidekick will delay how long it, it, it waits to retry the job the next time. So, the idea here is that Sidekick will retry up to 25 times, which in practice means it will retry over the course of about three weeks, 21 days. So all you need to do is fix the code, deploy that code, and then Sidekick will just retry the job and it'll work. So in practice, that we fix the code, We can deploy it. And then at some point in the future, Sidekick will retry that job. So let's refresh. So it's going to retry it in less than a minute ago. <laughs> can see through time? It's new math. There it goes. OK, so it just, it just retried it, and it worked. Okay. So we refresh the page. The retry is gone. All good. And right with the world. Uh, but sometimes that just won't happen. It may be an edge case, but sometimes you're going to hit that 21-day that limit, and the job's just not going to work. At that point, Sidekick gives up and says, this job's never going to work. It's dead. And as you might imagine, that's what this queue is. This is the dead job queue. These are jobs that Sidekick has given up on and is no longer going to automatically retry. Jobs live in here for up to six months. So you have six months to go back, fix the code, deploy it, and then retry it manually. That's as simple as obviously just checking the box and hitting retry now. But the point is, is that Sidekick will not retry stuff forever. Eventually it will go away. After six months, if you still haven't run it, uh, Sidekick will prune the, bed, the, the dead job queue and the job will just be discarded completely. Yes. Um, if, if I'm waiting for 21 days for a job to retry and I've got a customer waiting on the other end, 21 days is probably too long. Mm -hmm. Do you have good hooks for monitoring and with the APIs, that kind of stuff, so I can alert myself? Like, hey, this thing's going to be trying for a day and it hasn't succeeded yet? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, what I recommend people do is they run with an error service, like Honey Badger or Bug Snag. Uh, this, the retries UI is nice, it's simple, but it's not a production capable system that will track tens of thousands of errors or something like that. Um, I still recommend uh, using a, an error service that will email you when an error occurs so that you can constantly be informed of jobs that are continuing to fail. Um, and, and Sidekick doesn't wait 21 days. 
well, it retries 25 times over 21 days, right? right. But, but like if, if I'm if I'm on retry 24, mm -hmm. that's been you might see three days. days. You might see a three-day pause. Yeah. Right. And at that point, like it's been too long, and so if I forgot to come check the queue in 10 and a half days, I've got customers on the other end who are mm -hmm. unhappy mm -hmm. with me, mm -hmm. and so I want to get warned before then that there's a problem. Yeah, that's a that's a tough nut to crack. Um, I don't know if I have a, an answer for that. Um, well, the data would all just be in Redis, right? You could like yeah, I mean, write Jekyll a has a full Ruby API by which you can iterate through retries. Um, you know, maybe you write some custom code that maybe a reach task or a cron job that runs more data. jobs or a psychic job that it's background jobs all the way down. But... <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, we have a Nagios alert that monitors the failed jobs queue and will just let us know when it grows past a certain size, depending on the projects on certain sizes are different. But and yeah, the error services also. So both those help. I mean, like we use New Relic, so <laughs> <laughs> we got that. But I was asking mostly because this is a problem that a lot of people face when they first get background jobs. How do you monitor that thing? Right. And and what I'm asking is, are there good hooks for getting your monitoring system into Sidekick? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's an interesting question because I wouldn't expect Sidekick to monitor itself, but I expect it to make it easy for me to monitor it with not using Relic or Honey Badger, my tool of choice. Right. You can iterate through the failed jobs list and just not. That's what we have around here. Sort of do is iterate the failed jobs list in order to get a certain size. So, okay. There's an infinite variety of monitoring code you can write. And so I, I don't necessarily have anything out of the box. But I do provide APIs where you can monitor queue size and queue latency. So you could easily write something that uh, emits that as JSON to some other endpoint. Uh, maybe a ping that check or, like we said, uh, an audio check or something like that. We have another question way to bring it back. No? OK. Uh, so we talked about retries. We talked about the dead queue. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is this schedule tab. Uh, as I said before, you not only want to be able to create background jobs to run right now, but you also want to be able to schedule jobs to run a day from now, an hour from now, who knows. And Sidekick has a really simple API for doing this. Active Job also provides an API for doing essentially the same thing. Uh, in Sidekick's case, it's called Perform At instead of Perform Async. So you just say perform at, I'm sorry, perform in. Perform in one minute, and then the arguments that you would pass to perform. So we got our JID E4. And notice nothing right in here. And that's because it's scheduled. No. So we'll go back to the schedule tab. <clears throat> and you can see now we've got a job there. And you can see, Sidekick says, it's going to run a minute. No. Now, the way this works is that Sidekick pulls Redis every 15 seconds for jobs. So your job won't necessarily run exactly one minute from now. It'll run at some number of seconds right after one minute. So you don't get microsecond or millisecond precision, or even second precision. Uh, but for 99% of folks, this is close enough. So we can go back and we can see that Psychic still has not run it yet. <clears throat> That's okay. Uh, one thing I do want to show, does anyone here speak Russian? Da. Okay, good. Jonan speaks Russian. Okay, Jonan, can you translate this for me? <laughs> can I change my language so that Russian is the first one? I can refresh and boom. Psychic UI is in Russian. Nice. Uh, the UI actually supports 21 different languages. Rubyists don't just speak English. Um, so, in fact, last week we added Tamil and Hindi, which is pretty awesome. That's another billion people that uh, can use Psychic now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 21 different languages. JID is the same in Russian? <laughs> I guess so. It's, it's, a, it's kind of an abbreviation, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I didn't even know they had words that started with three. 
How, how do you sort that? Does that sort correctly? I, I don't know. And then there's another word here, which just is B. Yeah. Russian's a crazy language, I guess. Uh, but. Louder, louder. Come on. No comments? Um, if we refresh the, uh, the, the schedule page, or whatever this is, however this is pronounced, we can see that our scheduled job is disappeared. <laughs> we can go back to Sidekick and we can see that it ran before. Yay. Uh, so, that's all I have in terms of the demo. Any, anything else anybody else wants to see? Any questions? Yes, in the back. Sure. So, we're going to do a little live coding. Woo! Yeah, hot stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, here's a test that I wrote, so I'm not going to have to live code, so ha ha. <laughs> uh, so, this is actually a Rails unit test for testing our active job. But it's the exact same idea as uh, with the sidekick native worker. You're just going to do the job, and you call perform on it. It's, it's really just a method invocation. So we're, we're actually creating a post which has some obscenity in it, notably the poop here. And uh, we actually call perform on that post. We reload the post and verify that we changed the title on the bottom. <coughs> That's it. There's, there's no real integration in that we're not actually running Sidekick here. We're just testing Ruby objects. Um, so uh, if I am doing like an integration test that like actually fires up a browser and like tests my Rails app, um, I can't go in there and do all the jobs as perform instead of perform async. So will I still be able to test um, that the workers are working? A much more advanced question. Um, so Sidekick supports a number of testing modes. One mode is called inline. And what that means is that when you call perform async to create that, that Sidekick background job, it will actually execute that background job right then inside the Rails process, and it won't send it to Redis. That allows your tests to execute that background job code and verify that the changes take place due to that controller invocation or whatever your browser is doing. So that's what you'd want to do is you'd want to have some sort of integration environment that turns on inline mode. Yes? Does that have uh, a lot of priorities of jobs? It has some simple uh, queue prioritization support. Yes, it supports um, strict priority. So you can say, check this queue, or check the critical queue, then check the default queue, then check the low queue. So you'll always get a strict uh, priority check. It also uh, supports weighted checks. So you can say this queue is 10 times more important than this other queue, and so check it 10 times as often. That gets you 95 of the way. It solves the, the problem for 95% of the people. Yes. Um, this is like a, just a, a maybe a new question, but so you kind of talked about um, the job. The job gets goes into the Redis, and that and that that's um, where Psychic is looking. Once the job is processed, um, how does how does like the process job is that is after job handle like the finished job like modifying the Rails database? Like how does the change like? Gets get written to whatever the data the database that Rails is using for storage. So, when you execute this job, Psychic so pulls it out of Redis and instantiates the object and calls the perform method. What this perform method is doing is just using your database. It's just calling with Active Record like any other piece of Ruby code might in your Rails app. So the actual changes that this background job is doing are going into your MySQL database. And, and so the only change to Redis is the job has been removed from Redis. 
executed and then thrown away because no, it executed safely. I think that makes sense. So I think the missing piece of information is that the sidekick process is your Rails app with some additional stuff on it. So like anything you can do in your Rails app, you can do in a worker because the worker has access to your Rails app. It's essentially like running another copy of your Rails app. So if I'm not mistaken, then like for this filter obscenity job, uh, maybe I just missed it, but when, when you call that job from your controller, are you like, you're saving the unfiltered version to the database and then you're, you're creating this job instance to, to like save the altered, exactly. the filtered version at a later point? Exactly. To modify the, to modify the okay. Okay. So the controller <laughs> is saving that, like you say, obscenity laden post. <laughs> it takes that, that ID of that post, pushes the ID to Redis, Sidekick pulls the job out, passes the ID to perform, we're then, post, we're then pulling that post out of the database, filtering the attributes, and then resaving it again. So you go from unfiltered to quickly filtered, but in the background. So speaking back on that, um, might be a good time to bring up that. In this example, if you were to run this uh, in the background, when the page reloads, it actually still has the obscenity in the post, right? Because it's being done in the background. So if you were testing it this. It can. It but can? Psychic is extremely fast. But it never reloaded the post in the controller. No, but it redirected. You save it, the post, yeah. and then that redirects to the post's URL. Okay. And there are that's a race condition. There are mm -hmm. times when Psychic is fast enough where it can actually filter the obscenity out, and then when the redirect actually uh, takes effect and, and load that post's page, you'll actually see the filtered version of it. That's called fun with your QA department. Yeah. Uh, well, so like, the only way to get around that, you can just put a Boolean column that just says filtered, and then part of this job could be, uh, you know, to make mark that as true once it's actually been filtered, and then you only show the post like once it's been filtered, or you could just have some JavaScript that reloads it or reloads the page or something like that. Yes. So earlier, Rico asked about heavy Ruby objects. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so let's, let's uh, continue on with my slides then. Um, I'm done with the demo, such as it is. I want to talk about three best practices. Uh, the number one practice is keep your input simple for those jobs. <laughs> Don't pass complex Ruby objects. Um, as I said, Psychic uses Redis for its storage. And it uses JSON on it as its data format. So anything you pass to that background job using perform later or perform async is actually translated into JSON. And complex Ruby objects don't translate into JSON very easily. Um, things like dates and timestamps don't translate to JSON. So you need to keep the, your input with really simple data types. String, int, float, hashes, arrays, that sort of thing. And by doing that, that keeps your background jobs really simple. They, they take a, bunch, a, a few just really simple arguments. And from there, they can load all the data they need into memory. They can hit the database to load the post and that sort of thing. <clears throat> yes? And, well, and in theory, if you actually passed in a Ruby object and it, it, you somehow could get it like unmodified, you wouldn't be able to do what you did where you shut down your Redis or your sidekick instance fixed the bug, restarted it, because in theory you would have the version of the object that had the messed up method on it or whatever. Um, well, right, like you, the, you would run into issues where you might, there are certain types of bugs you might not be able to absolutely. fix, right? So the more data you store in Redis instead of your database, the more out of sync the two can get. If you're storing your post in the database, but then you also persist the post to Redis, the two can get out of sync, and you can get what is known as a, a stale data um, issue. Uh, and so if you're filtering those attributes that are in Redis, you may uh, find yourself overwriting the data that is in the database and, and causing problems. So uh, like I said, keep, keep, it, keep it simple, stupid, as they say, and um, simple identifiers, numbers, strings, that sort of thing. Uh, 
I keep your jobs idle and potent. This is a really fancy term that just means your jobs should be able to be executed more than once without harm. Without harm. So uh, I've got an example here. Three really simple lines that are perilous. This is an example of an e-commerce background job where you want to refund a credit card charge to the user. Our, our single argument is the charge ID. That's following rule number one, which is keeping our input really simple. We look up the charge in the database, and then on the second line, we call void transaction. That calls out to our credit card company and voids the credit card charge. And then on the third line, we execute the code necessary to create the email saying to the user, hey, we just refunded your charge. The, the problem, though, is that what happens if that error, or what happens if that email fails? Well, Sidekick's going to catch that error and put it on the retry key and then retry it 30 seconds from now, 5 minutes from now, 10 minutes from now. It's going to retry it over and over and over. And so every time we retry, we're going to look up that charge again and we're going to call void transaction. What happens when we call void transaction many times? Is that going to double uncharge the user, the customer? I don't know. But that's something you need to keep in mind when you're developing background jobs, that this could be called more than once. And you don't want to be giving extra money or uh, causing problems. So ideally, what that, that void transaction does is it knows that if it's already been voided, it just does not. Just it does nothing. It's a no off. The last best practice is to make your jobs concurrent. Ensure and consider how it's your system's going to perform when you not just execute one job, but you execute a hundred jobs in parallel. You may have a job which creates thumbnails for an image that a user uploads, which is great. But what happens when that user uploads 100 images? Now, you, now you're crushing your machine trying to create 100 thumbnails in parallel. The same thing is true of third-party APIs. Uh, at this e-commerce vendor I worked at, we had uh, a third-party ERP system. And so we had our product database, and we synced our product information to the ERP system. Well, we also had a bulk reprice tool. So we could say, <coughs> for this category of product or this brand of product, lower the price by 10%. So what's going to happen there? We're going to reprice a 1,000 products. Every single product creates its own background job. And now we've got a 1,000 products that are slamming our third-party ERP system, all trying to sync over at the same time. Within about five minutes, we got a call from our ERP vendor saying, stop that right now. Uh, and we will suspend your account. So we, click, we quickly shut down Sidekick and uh, rejiggered our code. Uh, the, yes? Oh, I was just going to say, we also have the opposite problem where we would cycle through all of our accounts and say, update the type of app that they had. But as we grew, that number of accounts became larger and larger, and we had one background job doing it, so the background job would run for hours and hours and hours. Um, so we actually had to, we created a background job to spawn other background jobs off. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah the, the, there's a trade-off in doing everything in one single job, you know, in a loop, yeah. versus creating 10,000 jobs, each of which update a single record. Uh, Sidekick makes jobs pretty cheap, so I tend to tell people to create lots of jobs. But they'll execute really fast, and if you've got a, a bunch of Sidekick processes, you'll go through hundreds uh, per second. Uh, but that is uh, the last thing to be aware of, is when you create lots and lots of jobs, you might find that you're crushing your own database, <coughs> because all your jobs are using active record to change state effectively. So you need to ensure that your database grows as your business and your background job load grows. Yes? Can you configure Sidekick to limit the number of workers that can run concurrently for a particular job type? You can't do it based on job type. You can globally configure the number of threads that Sidekick will run. 
Uh, there are some third-party plugins for Sidekick that allow you to limit concurrency in various ways. Uh, my rule is that Sidekick Core will never limit concurrency. And so if you want to do things like throttle or rate limit, um, mix and match, however, whatever your business logic you want, uh, you've got to use a third-party API for that, or you've got to write your own application logic, which uh, maybe does locking or something like that. Yes? If you had two sidekick processes, you could configure one of each to listen to a specific key, and then configure the number of threads there. Yeah, absolutely. That's it's it's really kind of a, kind of a hack, kind of a coarse grain solution. But you can have one sidekick process with five threads configured to listen to a, a certain queue, and another sidekick process with 50 threads configured to listen to a completely different queue. And that way, you'll process that queue with 50 threads much faster, theoretically, than the one with five threads. Uh, we did something similar for that ERP vendor where we were crushing the ERP vendor. We put them into a separate queue that was uh, listened by less psychic processes, so you had less threads that could slam them. Anything else? Over here somewhere? Yeah, way in back. Way in back. Okay, Jesse, yes. Uh, so one thing, back on the two slides ago, you were talking about simple data types. Um, one thing that's got me a number of times is that symbol is not on there. Yeah. And so if you, let's say like you need to pass a hash in and it has a symbol as a key, it's going to get turned into JSON, put into Redis. And then when it gets pulled out, the, it's normal for keys to be turned into strings, not symbols. So if you go to then look up things by a symbol, it won't be there. So right. just know that you can use a hash with a different access. You can, or you can load it yourself or something. But it's more that it's it gets it every time. <laughs> even, if, even if you've experienced it, it'll be again. So just know that if you do need to get stuff, it's best to use. And Sandy is doing the same thing over and over with, with the same result. No, it's the JSON. So just be aware that uh, things will come back out, hashes will come back out. Yeah, note, note that symbol is not on this list. Uh, also note that keyword arguments are not on this list. So doing, trying to do fancy Ruby method stuff um, is sort of frowned upon. So again, that, that goes back to just keep it simple. You can, you can pass a hash, but you'll, you'll want to ensure that you use strings rather than symbols. Yes? Um, I just wanted to mention that the, a different caveat is that with the Java API, it is saved as active record models. Yeah. Um, because this is handled by active job where it will turn your model into the name and ID and then fetch it back again. So it is safe to pass that in. Right. Active job uh, and I have some disagreements <laughs> as to the best practices <laughs> for job APIs. Um, they try to do as they try to support as much Ruby as possible. I treat it, I try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, if you look inside Active Job, the serialization logic is actually quite involved. Um, so, for things like keyword arguments, they create a separate object uh, which encapsulates those keyword arguments, and then they do all this logic to deserialize it. Um, and so, all that comes at a cost. There's a performance cost there. So. Um, I guess models are pretty simple that's with the global ID. Yeah. Um, yeah, it serializes it to a URL and, and then uses that URL to create it. Can um, you still end up with a stale data process? No, because it's not persisting the actual model data, it's just persisting the identifier. Oh, because this serialization logic doesn't persist it that Correct. Okay. It uses global ID to serialize the identifier <laughs> as a URL. Um, so it will work, but I, I've, I've taught people, or I've tried to tell people to keep their input as simple as possible, just pass identifiers. And so I don't want to necessarily change that based on active job. The Sidekick API just tries to say it's as, as simple as possible. Um, so yes? John. Um, I remember reading it in Rescue, there were some issues with uh, 
Chris, you popping things off of Redis, failing the job, and then, of course, never putting it back into Redis. Does Sanctuary have that issue? Do we have to do anything special to make sure that our jobs are really do run so Sidekick uses the same Redis logic that Rescue does. It was originally written as a better Rescue, and so I used the same algorithm. Um, for those in the know, that's the Redis BR hop operation. The problem with that algorithm that Rescue suffers from and Sidekick the free version suffers from, is that you pop that job out of Redis into, into the memory of the sidekick process, and the job is gone from, from Redis. If that sidekick process then crashes, due to like seg faults of a bug in a native gem, you will actually lose that job. So Sidekick Pro offers a reliable algorithm that uses a different um, mechanism for retrieving that job, which is which always keeps the job in Redis, so that you won't lose it if the process crashes. It just moves it somewhere else in Redis. Yeah, it, it pops it from the public queue onto what's called private queue. That private queue is specific to that one side process, um, and and so that is just, that's merely a legacy of the way Rescue worked and the way I initially implemented it. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Way in the back. What are some of the advantages of Psychic over Psychic? Um, Psychic's advantage over most of the other systems is uh, it's massively more efficient. Um, it'll do an order of magnitude more work per process than delayed job or rescue. And it, it does that by being multi-threaded. Rescue and delay job are single threaded, and so you're doing one job at a time. Whereas Sidekick actually uses 25 threads and pulls jobs for those 25 threads as fast as possible. So it is totally normal for people to see an order of magnitude performance increase over the uh, single threaded job systems like Rescue and Delay Job. Suppose you're really scared of threading. Yes. Suppose you have a mature system and you're wondering, how can I safely migrate to site? Mm -hmm. Is concurrency one a good solution to get started? A concurrency one actually is effectively single thread. Yeah. So you can certainly do that. Um, what I advise people is to start small with and and migrate workers over. So start with a single worker. And, and run it with uh, you know, two or three threads and, and vet those workers, test them in staging, your, your staging environment, and um, slowly gain confidence in the code that you're migrating into sidekick jobs. So uh, you, your system, your, your legacy system, might have 100 different background jobs that are in rescue or delay job. You can still run that, those those background workers while also running Sidekick. Yeah, I was figuring that uh, for migration, changing one thing is better than two. Mm -hmm. And switching job systems before and able to concurrency might be a good way to sort of break that up. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of any caveats or would you warn against doing that sort of approach? I mean, if you're already using a single threaded job system, moving from that to Sidekick is is fine and it seems, seems like a, a reasonable solution. Yeah, and then like you say, as you gain more confidence, you can you can up the threads. And you can target your multi-threaded jobs to different queues that are processed by a multi-threaded instance rather than a single threaded instance. Anything else? All right, thank you everybody.